Hi, everyone. I'm Anwaliko Konjo. I am um, the host for Advaya's upcoming course, Reimagining Women in Power. I'm a social impact strategist um, and a women's rights advocate, and I'm really excited to be speaking with Rianne Eisler today. Um, Rianne is a social system scientist, cultural historian, futurist, and attorney whose research, writing, and speaking has transformed millions. Known for her work in advancing partnership-based societies and diagnosing our crises as a result of power over, power, power, uh, power over paradigm, Rianne is the leading Opening, is leading the opening session of our course, which is really, really, really exciting. Um, so in today's conversation, we're going to be exploring her academic approach, the key findings of her famous book, The Chalice and the Blade, The Myth of War as Human Nature, Transcending Binary Thinking, and Understanding the Power over Paradigm and How We Transform It to More. So welcome, Rianne. It's really great to have you today. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to jump right into the questions. We have so much to sort of unpack, and obviously we'll be able to go even deeper when we begin the Reimagining Women in Power course um, later on this month. But the first question I have for you is, it's obviously very difficult for you to cover your entire life's work, so I won't ask you to, but we'd love for you, for our community, to have a better sense of what you do and the experience you bring to opening the keynotes in this course. Um, could you share a little bit with us about what it means to be a social system scientist and a cultural historian, and what specific academic approach you take to diagnosing cultural and systemic crises? Well, I think the term social systems scientist, the emphasis is on systems. Mm -hmm. And I think you probably noticed, or maybe not because we've been so brainwashed, to take it for granted that most uh, social science really uh, either marginalizes or just ignores the majority of humanity, women and children. And what my approach, which is the study of relational dynamics, looks at uh, is how the core elements that maintain a social system uh, relate to each other, that's one thing, and of course the status of family relations uh, is very, very important, the status of women and children, which is ignored. The other part of relational dynamics is what uh, I'm, I'm Melika, uh, forgive me if I'm massacring your name, <laughs> it's a beautiful name, but it's uh, unfamiliar to me. Um, what uh, really you referred to, which is uh, what kinds of relationships does a system support? And um, again, the distinction is, does it uh, ranking or linking uh, hierarchies of domination, or what I call, because we have to point new words, to really look at uh, the whole picture, which we're not used to, or hierarchies of actualization. Mm. And that led me really to not only look at the whole of humanity, at the whole of our human relations, including where we all live in our family and other intimate relations, not just politics and economics as conventionally defined, but also prehistory. Mm -hmm. The whole span of our cultural evolution going back thousands of years and to coin two new terms for describing social configurations are terms that transcend right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, the partnership configuration and the domination configuration or the dominator configurations. Hmm. So how would you describe the partnership configuration versus the domination configuration and what types of societies or structures lend themselves to either of those? Well, uh, we're not used to these terms, but as I said, well, Einstein said it, he said you can't solve problems with the same thinking that right. created them. And 
uh, linguistic psychologists have long told us that the categories, and this is very true of the social categories provided by a culture's language, they channel our thinking. Mm -hmm. So these configurations, not surprisingly from what I earlier told you, take into account uh, relations not only in politics and economics as conventionally defined, and I will get back to that uh, at some point, uh, this conventionally defined because we have left, left out, well, we have a gendered system of values mm -hmm. uh, that devalues uh, in politics and in economics anything stereotypically associated with women or the so-called feminine, whether it's in women, men, or anybody in between. Uh, but to get back to what we're talking about, the domination configuration, uh, well, uh, to simplify it in terms of the title of the book that I'm best known for, The Chalice and the Blade, the blade is a symbol of power for domination systems. It's the power to control, to dominate, uh, to take life. Mm -hmm. uh, the palace is also powerful, and that's what we have to understand, that there's nothing wrong with power. It's a way to define power. It is not power over. It is power with and power to. It is the power to give life, to nurture life, and it's to illuminate life, because we humans really need meaning. And not surprisingly, yes, if you look at these two configurations, uh, the first component is how family and with it economic and social relations of all kinds and structures are, are they top-down rankings with hierarchies and domination, or are they more based on mutuality, on linking, uh, on hierarchies of actualization. Gender plays a huge role, and I will really, have, there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, and of course, if you think about it, when you have power over as the definition of power, you have lots of abuse and violence built into the system, because right. how else are you gonna maintain these rankings? Right, absolutely. I think, yeah, you made an, an, a very important point, which is that power itself is not the issue. It's the way that power is configured, the type of power. And if we only ever imagine power as being power over, then we're obviously going to, you know, have sort of destructive and, um, you know, harmful systems and relationships. Um, I think that's really imp important. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, because I think that's one of the key sort of tenants of this course. So I'm looking forward to exploring that in a little bit um, more depth. Um, before I go on to the next question, something that came to mind is that um, you talked about studying sort of the whole of humanity. And I'm really curious because obviously we live in a world that's so sort of you know diverse and rich in the different types of cultures and structures of societies that we live in. So um, how do you go about studying the whole of humanity and what do you look for? <laughs> Well, you look for patterns, for configurations. And we're not taught to think of that way because what we know from some of the newer approaches are chaos theory, self-organizing theory, nonlinear dynamics, is that in complex living systems and human beings are complex human living systems and societies, human societies are very complex living systems, it isn't just a question of linear causes and effects. It's a question of interconnections. Right. And so if you don't look at these interconnections, you're completely missing the boat. And we have very siloed universities, very fragmented consciousness. Our conventional categories fragment our consciousness. You know, one focuses on location, and other, you know, north, north, south, east, west. One focuses on economics, and other fo one focuses, you know, secular or religious. It, you, you're never going to figure out anything with this fragmented consciousness. So we need new words, and we need new approaches. Right. Absolutely. 
So in your book, The Chalice and the Blade, you talk about this fundamental shift that occurred, um, a cataclysmic turning point during the uh, prehistory of Western civilization in which the trajectory of society changed forever. Can you talk about what that shift was? Well, it was the shift from primarily an orientation. I'm, you're always talking about what I call the biocultural partnership nomination scale or lens, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very powerful lens, by the way, to, to really look at human societies, at human evolution. And what you see is that for millennia, uh, starting in how we all lived in gathering hunting societies, and notice I put gathering first, Mm. not hunting, because most of the subsistence was through gathering. Uh, you know, we've really taught, I have two chapters in the Chalice and the Blade called Reality Stood on Its Head. Our job okay. now is to stand reality right side up. Okay? So, number one, the even into the early agrarian societies, the first farming societies like Chatalhuyak, the largest Neolithic site ever excavated, uh, you have more of a partnership orientation because as I said, it's always a matter of degree. Oh. But uh, in we know from chaos theory uh, that in periods of great disequil disequilibrium, great turmoil, and we are in such a period right now, by the way. So we really have a chance uh, to to move again in a partnership direction, not to any good old days, okay? Because these were not ideal societies and they had less of, of it, far less technology, obviously. Um, but we know the configuration and we know the four cornerstones we have to build, which I'll get into. Uh, but right now to answer your question, what happened during this period was a cataclysmic shift towards a domination direction right. in our cultural evolution. Right. I think when you say that, you know, we're in a period of um, great turmoil, that's something that uh, a lot of people um, may have heard. And more so than heard, it's, I think a lot of us feel it, but then feeling also the opportunity that, that it creates, like you say, to sort of move towards partnership, move towards recognizing our inter, inter, um, interdependence is really important as well. And I think sometimes we can get wrapped up in, in the, the feeling of turmoil that we sort of miss the forest through the trees in a sense. Would you agree with that? Very definitely. And this is you really using this lens enables you to see both the forest and the trees. Mm -hmm you will. And you really have to focus on both. Uh, and I think that we have a lot of regression today towards the domination side, regression to strongman rule in both the family and the economic system and the state or tribe. I mean, let's not, you know, periods of disequilibrium for people who are for, you know, domination systems are really trauma factories. And it starts in domination oriented families. Right. And a lot of the denial that we see, I mean, it's, a, it's fascinating because my last book, um, which came out in 2019 with Oxford University Press, Nurturing Our Humanity. And the subtitle is How Domination and Partnership Shape Our lives, our brains, and our future. Mm. And a denial is built into domination uh, systems starting in families. So you get climate change denial, you get election result denial, you get COVID-19 denial. Eventually, these people can move. I mean, experiments show that, but it takes them a long time. And they tend to, so to speak, follow the authority. The strong absolutely. man. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think that's 100% true. And um, I think it's really important that you mentioned how, you know, we sort of inherit this denial. And um, I, on a, this is a little bit sort of um, off the books, uh, but I was just thinking about how today 
a lot of people are reflecting on um, the passing of, um, you know, the Queen of England. And there's a mixture of responses from, depending on, you know, the context that people are coming from, people who were formerly sort of colonized by, by Britain and um, people who are, you know, English subjects today, um, you know, grappling with what feels like erasure and denial and, and the, the history of domination um, in the present moment where people are, um, you know, dealing with the, th the themes that you've talked about in real time, how do you, um, how do you sort of think about responding to those histories, those mixture of responses that we get to, to, to a legacy of sort of domination that has shaped the whole world? Well, if you really think in terms of the partnership and domination configuration, rather than right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, or whatever, capitalist, yeah. socialist, uh, which, as I said, really fragment our consciousness, um, you can see why some people, in especially in a time of disequilibrium, a time of turbulence like ours, would want to sort of hang on to what's familiar. And the top-down system is familiar to a lot of people, starting their families. You know, why do you think, really, that, uh, and I, I'm shifting to... Uh, Another example, why do you think that people trying to push us back who want more punitive policies, uh, who really want uh, control, right, over the quote, and only can be given any empathy at all, have only the so called in group? Uh, why do you think that they put so much focus on family relations? Let me think of that for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an accident, is it? So we just you to find some people who understand that our unprecedented uh, challenges today require new thinking. But we also have to find people who, especially, but not everyone, and this is a good thing, and as I said, we can all change our five years. You know, nurturing our humanity draws very heavily from neuroscience, which mm. verifies these kinds of conclusions, by the way, big time, big time. And it verifies, it confirms that using the partnership domination biocultural social scale is very important for us if we are to build a better society. But... To answer your question, it really depends very much on people's life experiences. And it's right. up to every one of us to show that there is a better alternative, that there is a better configuration, and that we can build it. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I, there's so much that we could talk about. But well, I'm going to move to the next question, which is that relatedly, you've said before, regarding the notion that war is human nature, um, that what archaeology shows is that war is at most five to 10,000 years old. It's a drop in the evolutionary bucket. Can you talk us through this myth and other myths that we've been told about human nature and why they're so pervasive? Well, as you probably know, uh, um, Molika, um, I have, through my research, identified four cornerstones that are foundational, that strangely, not so strangely, the people who want to push us back to more rigid domination times uh, always pay a lot of attention to childhood, gender, economics, but going really beyond this argument between capitalism and socialism to what right. I call a caring economics of partnerism, and yes, story and language. And normative stories, you know, like the caveman cartoon, in the one hand, he's got a club, a weapon, right? Mm -hmm. Other one, what is he doing? He's dragging a woman by the hair. So what does it tell us? It tells us that domination systems, uh, violence, warfare, Mm. Uh, injustice, but just human nature, that is a false story. Mm. And the archaeological evidence, as I said, is that 
There are no signs of destruction in the archaeological records until five to ten thousand, you know, it depends on the place, uh, five to ten thousand years ago. I mean, think about that. There's so many people in the academy still who have made the assumption that war, I mean, you know, you read about it. You know, I start with the assumption that human nature is warlike, right? Well, wow. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, these stories have become so embedded, not just in, and I think maybe this also goes back to finding those patterns because um, these stories have become so pervasive, not just in one culture, but across multiple cultures and societies around the world. Um, do you think there are opportunities for um, sort of starting to ground new stories, new narratives, new types of economics? Absolutely. And, you know, there is movement in that direction. I mean, think about it for a moment. Uh, partnership trends in terms of the four cornerstones. We know today so much more about child development. Right. I mean, than we ever have. And we know that it isn't a question of genes, but of gene expression. And that we must pay attention to childhood experiences and not coincidentally, uh, for example, some of these so-called Christian, and, and they're really false. I mean, they, 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 they cherry pick. Right. Uh, very punitive so-called parenting guides that want children to learn that the, a parent's word is law. Hey, there's a method behind this madness, right? So, uh, the trend today, we hear so much more about women, about, you know, the Me Too movement. It's still marginalized, but it's in the media conversation. It needs to be, okay? Economics, there are so thousands and thousands of NGOs working in one way or another for a different, more just, less top-down economics. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are people all over who are really questioning, questioning, especially young people, but also old people like me, right. questioning the story, doing the research, finding out what is the real story and language. Uh, you know, we hear about empowering rather and disempowering. These are new words. Mm -hmm. They're about hierarchies of actualization rather than domination, aren't they? Absolutely. And even with empowering and disempowering, there's, you know, um, complexity to how those words are used, whether we talk about empowering others versus their ability to sort of empower themselves and, um, you know, the relationships that we have with with each other in that sense. Um, yeah, I think this is this is all um, very, very fascinating. Um, so in our upcoming course on reimagining women in power, we seek a deeper explana explanation and solution for our times. Um, so why is it important to emphasize, um, to then emphasize um, that we, when we reject patriarchy, we aren't supporting the rise of matriarchy instead? How might this get us to think deeper about the problem, not as masculinity versus femininity or male versus female, but rather an approach to the problem as a question of power over or domination-based relationships? Well, this is essential because, you know, semantics, language, the only alternatives in our language, in English, uh, that focuses on gender in terms of describing societies are two versions of a domination system. And actually the opposite of patriarchy is not matriarchy. It isn't a question of whether mothers rule or fathers rule. It's a it's partnership that's the alternative. And you know, I have so many men get in touch with me, talk to me. I used to do a lot of keynotes before COVID in person. Um, you know, stop me after a keynote saying, thank you, thank you for providing a category partnership that involves me, that includes me semantically and in every conceivable way, because domination systems not only rank man over woman, they rank man over man, race over race, 
religion over religion, uh, everything, there always has to be an out group. But we have to really pay attention to gender because why do you think that those people pushing us back have such rigid gender stereotypes and are so really stuck in this ranking of mm -hmm. so-called masculine over feminine? In both women and men, you know, women call men who are caring, who are soft, they call them wimps in right. their education systems. I mean, this is not a question of women against men or men against women, but we need new language in order to express new realities. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's everything. I'm, I'm kind of holding back a lot <laughs> because I'm so excited for us to, you know, delve into this conversation deeper when we um, begin the course and also have the opportunity for the participants to ask you questions just as I have. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on, I'm going to hold off on the questions I've, I've written down until, until that session, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you for giving us your time and your knowledge. Um, I absolutely recommend that everyone um, who hasn't already um, um, find Rianne's book, The Chalice and the Blade. And if you are joining the Women in Power, Reimagining Women in Power course, read it <laughs> so, so that we can have a rich discussion. I would suggest that if you're purchasing a copy, Kindle will have, I wrote a new epilogue, taking mm -hmm. it to the Trump years uh, back, uh, and it would be the 56th printing. So don't get anything before the 56th or 57th printing. Uh, right. I mean, it's not that expensive to get a new copy rather than a used one. Great, absolutely. Um, so, okay, so just a reminder to anyone who's watching that um, we have a 20% off discount for the course. Um, if you do want to join us, um, just use the code LIVE20 and um, you can find um, you can find it on the womenempower.co website. Um, so please join us. Please join the conversation. And thank you again, Rianne. Well, and thank you, my dear. Thank you so much for your wonderful questions and for offering this course. <laughs>